welcome everyone to the March 31st, 2020 meeting of the Committee of the Whole of the King County Council. As we start today, I want to acknowledge that one, though we may be spread across the county today, we are on the traditional lands of the Puget Salish peoples past and present. We thank these caretakers of the land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. I'd like to also acknowledge the, the many urban Indians in King County who have brought their cultural ways of life here and greatly enriched our community. Today in our meeting, we'll be receiving briefings on the county's COVID-19 response, as well as um, state and federal responses. I will note for those wishing to provide comments at today's meeting, that we'll be taking public comments up following the first briefing on our agenda. Please stay on the phone if you wish to give public comment. Um, with that, if I can ask um, Ms. Calderon to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Bagdushki? Council Member Dembowski? Here. Bagdushki is here. Thank you. Council Member Dunn? Here. Council Member Caldwell? Here. Council Member Lumber? Here. Council Member Up the Road? Here. Council Member Von Bauer? Here. Council Member Sahalai? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. You do have a quorum, sir. Thank you. Um, point, of I don't point of personal privilege, Mr. Chair. Could, as you may recall Council from the sound transit wait, meeting. One, one moment, please. Council Member Von Reichsauer, please go ahead. As you may recall from the sound transit meeting, I made the request that we have a check afterwards because we don't know for sure whether or not we're being heard when we're saying we're present. So could we be told right now who is now marked as present just to make sure we don't have that same problem we had at sound transit? Yes, um, Council Member Von Reckbauer. And in fact, I heard um, all nine of us um, account for as present today. So we're all nine accounted as present on the call. And though no votes are expected today, should, should any vote come up in this meeting, I will make sure that um, we ask the clerk to acknowledge each vote so that members know that the vote has been recorded. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I would entertain a motion to appro approve the minute. So moved. Second. So moved. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the minutes of our February 24th meeting. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The minutes are approved. This meeting is being recorded. That takes us to item four on today's agenda, um, a briefing on the county's COVID-19 response. As I noted at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to take things out of order relative to the way we normally do things, with public comment coming after a briefing that gives a general overview of the county's COVID-19 response. Leo Floor, the Director of the Department of Community and Human Services, and Dwight Dively, the Director of the Office of Performance, Strategy, and Budget, will give us an update on the current data, what is happening with quarantine and recovery sites, how county departments are responding, as well as the county's labor response. Executive staff will also begin a conversation about what we know so far about potential economic impacts to the pandemic and how the county is accounting for them in our immediate response and recovery plans. I'll flag for members that we are working on setting up a briefing at a future meeting with the county's chief economist that will go into more detail on the economic impacts. The economist will likely have a fuller picture in late April or in May when more data is available, but I wanted to let members know that we can also hold a briefing earlier if desired. I will ask whoever is speaking first, Mr. Floor or Mr. Dively, to please pause after your remarks for member questions, and members to please hold your questions until that time or after both have spoken. Um, the last there? announcement I'll make... One moment, please. One, the last announcement I'll make is that I understand that Mr. Dively has a meeting at 3 p.m., so we'll make sure that he's um, well able to make that um, commitment. Um, Council Member? Thank you. When, um, Council our, Member Lambert. Thank you. When our speakers are speaking, can they uh, go um, on video? It's so much better to get their expressions and the whole thing and get full communication, and then that way we can see them as they're talking. 
I don't know if they have the ability to do that. If they do, um, they'd be welcome to, to do that. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Floor and Mr. Dively, the line is yours. Good morning, council members. Uh, this is Leo Floor from the Department of Community and Human Services. Uh, Councilmember Lambert, I will see if I get my video up and operating here. Uh, it is streaming from my side. I'm not sure if it's landing on it's your side. It's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. I would like to uh, focus this first part of the briefing around county operations in response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. There'll be three sections that I'll talk through. The first is uh, actions that we're taking with current institutions uh, and shelters uh, to uh, reinforce them or de-intensify them. Uh, the second will be a discussion of isolation and quarantine sites. Mm -hmm. And then third will be a discussion of uh, what we call uh, assessment center recovery centers or ACRCs. Uh, these are the larger congregate sites. Um, in the last opportunity I had to brief the council, we depicted all of these on a graph as a sort of uh, a blue strategy that is a persistent uh, reinforcement of shelters, a green strategy that is uh, an 18 month uh, reinforce or 18 month isolation and quarantine uh, set of actions. And then what we think is a shorter term, uh, two to three month emergent red strategy that is really to handle the, the peak of the outbreak. Uh, first, in terms of actions that we've taken uh, to reinforce or de-intensify existing institutions or shelters. Uh, these really support the uh, key goal that we all share of slowing the spread to reserve hospital capacity for those who need it uh, in an emergent fashion. Uh, and this has taken on the shorthand in our community and many others as flattening the curve. Uh, in terms of uh, shelter de-intensification, first I'll describe a, a set of actions that we've taken uh, first. Uh, we have uh, occupied uh, the arrivals hall at the King County Airport and used that to de-intensify the St. Martin de uh shelter, which was for uh, persons who are, are men who are 55 and older, operated by Catholic Community Services. When we say de-intensify, uh, that's a, a new term we've created uh, to, which means allowing a shelter to adopt public health guidance and CDC guidance around ensuring that people are six, far, six feet apart from each other. Uh, we have also uh, de-intensified the nightly shelter in the administration building for King County, as well as de-intensified the uh, nightly shelter that operates at the 4th and Jefferson building across the street from the administration building. And I have accomplished both of those by providing for additional spaces within each of the shelters so that uh, the people sleeping in there have the ability to get their mats further apart. We have issued uh, motel vouchers to high-risk shelters, including uh, shelters on the east side, uh, Congregations for the Homeless, uh, Sophia Way, or excuse me, Congregations for the Homeless, uh, Sophia Way. Uh, we have uh, done the same with uh, Downtown Emergency Services Center in Seattle and then Catholic Community Services uh, in the south of the county. That's a strategy that uh, is really appropriate for people who can go into a hotel room but who don't require on site uh, persistent case management. Uh, we have also uh, taken actions with Congregations uh, for the Homeless, which is a uh, Bellevue-based shelter, uh, to provide additional uh, uh, mini shelters that we will be delivering to their location so that they have the ability to isolate uh, a number of people uh, on site and have been uh, in con conversation with the city of Bellevue around that. Uh, we have taken the former Harborview Hall Enhanced Shelter and what will be, again, the Harborview Hall Enhanced Shelter uh, but have temporary disp temporarily displaced its 85 residents and set up a temporary shelter in the uh, uh, King, former King County Records building that's near the archives, uh, near Bailey Gatzert Elementary School. And that uh, movement has been completed and that has opened space for Harborview Hospital to establish its own isolation and quarantine facility that I'll mention later. Uh, and we believe that that facility should come online late this week. Uh, and then also in partnership with the City of Seattle, we have uh, uh, arranged for additional de-intensifications of uh, downtown emergency services center shelters and the City of Seattle has opened up both a number of community centers uh, as well as the Seattle Center Exhibition, Air, Ex Exhibition Hall and Fisher Pavilion in order to provide additional de-intensification spaces for shelters. So uh, a lot of work just to take the existing shelter network, spread folks out, 
uh, and ensure that we are uh, minimizing the conditions through which uh, disease can spread in these congregate settings. Uh, for the Council's awareness, we are also continuing to explore additional options uh, in, in this space. Uh, we have a lot of hotels that reach out to us and identify that they would be interested in, in having uh, or playing host to, to shelters that might need additional deintensification space, and that's a strategy that I will uh, provide an update to the uh, members of the Council on uh, should that be something that we move forward with. Uh, the remainder, I have previously briefed the Council on a lot of the other actions that we've taken around uh, increasing hygiene, cleaning, uh, technical assistance for shelters, and will not uh, provide additional information there unless a uh, Council member would like me to. Uh, the second of the three categories is isolation and quarantine. Uh, we do have uh, three isolation and quarantine facilities that are now operating. So these are the facilities in Seattle, uh, also called Aurora. Uh, the Issaquah facility uh, opened over the weekend. And then uh, the Central Motel in Kent uh, is also up and operating. Uh, between all of those, we have fully operational right now uh, 75 rooms. Uh, the capacity for all of those facilities uh, will eventually be up over 200 rooms. Uh, demand for the rooms so far, we have not uh, hit full capacity on any given night. Uh, one of the uh, you know, considerations that we continue to work through is, is which people will be able to be supported in an isolation and quarantine facility uh, at the last council full council meeting uh, the council acted upon a motion accepting the isolation quarantine report that describes some of the actions and, and uh, systems that we're putting in place at these isolation and quarantine facilities to make sure that they're accomplishing their goal uh, and we continue to modify uh, these processes to adjust these processes to bring more behavioral health medical uh, and security onto site for each of them so that we can continue to both operate the facilities, keep the people within them safe, and achieve the overall goal of slowing community spread. Uh, we still have one more uh, isolation and quarantine facility that uh, we expect to come online uh, not earlier than April 6th, and that's the Top Hat or White Center facility that will have an additional 32 rooms when complete. Uh, and then the fifth of the isolation and quarantine facilities uh, that I mentioned earlier that is not King County operated is the Harborview Hall facility. Uh, that will be 45 total beds is the latest we've gotten from Harborview Hall, and they'll be operating that as a high-intensity isolation and quarantine facility. Uh, and so the overall system that we'll have uh, when it's all said and done is uh, a Harborview Hall facility that is for folks who have higher behavioral health or medical needs, uh, and then four outlying facilities at uh, Seattle, Aurora, Issaquah, uh, Kent, and White Center that will be able to handle additional folks who need isolation and quarantine. And again, we do believe that this is a system that will be operating uh, for about 18 months. Just to uh, relay beyond the statistics and the descriptions, uh, we have had uh, a number of folks who have been staying at the facilities. Uh, at last I checked at Kent, we had people speaking four different languages uh, that were staying in that hotel. Uh, in the Aurora facility, we have a, a parent and her uh, eight-year-old child who normally live in their car and are able to uh, now isolate uh, as the mother recovers uh, within a place that, that's safer than their car and, and they're at the uh, Aurora site. Uh, we do continue to see more calls coming in every day and the rate of acceptance of our calls. We are initially accepting about 50% of all referrals to isolation and quarantine uh, and, and then we are now bringing up uh, bringing that acceptance rate up closer to 75% on the latest information that I've seen. The nightly census across facilities over the last three days has been uh, between, between 12 and 15, uh, and I expect uh, that that number is going to escalate quickly over the next two weeks as full-scale or larger-scale testing within shelters has begun over the last week. Uh, some good news in the last three batches of shelter-specific testing of which I am aware. Uh, none of those batches turned back more than one person uh, who tested positive in particular shelters or sets of shelters. So, do, so on the data that we have, we do not yet see widespread positive tests within uh, the sheltered population, uh, although we do get increasing reports about people who are showing symptoms um, but who have not yet had test results. So that is the uh, summary on isolation and quarantine. The last piece that I'll uh, cover here is what we've called ACRCs, or the larger congregate settings. 
the, the county has announced three of these facilities, one in Shoreline, one in Eastgate or Bellevue, and then one in uh, the Soto neighborhood of Seattle. Uh, we believe that the Shoreline and Eastgate facilities will each be able to handle up to 140 people. That's a smaller number than we had previously be, uh, briefed, and this is after uh, we worked with public health to make sure how many people we could get into these tents and also maintain uh, appropriate distancing while getting the rest of the equipment into these tents that we need. Uh, and then the Soto facility is actually a converted building that we're in the process of, of cleaning and refitting now uh, that uh, is really planned to open no earlier than April 20th uh, at a time that we're currently projecting to be uh, at or near uh, the peak of cases that could be coming. Uh, we do continue to look for a additional ability to have an ACRC site uh, in South King County, but have not identified a location for that at this time. Uh, the thing that distinguishes ACRC facilities from the IQ facilities, which is a question we get quite a bit, uh, a couple of factors. One is that the ACRC concept uh, uh, contemplates that we will be able to provide on-site testing uh, for COVID for people who uh, are referred to these sites or to report to these sites. Uh, the second is that these are congregate sites. They're not individual sites. And so they are really designed to be shorter term emergent congregate responses uh, should we hit a number of people that exceeds our isolation and quarantine capacity. Uh, and again, we believe this is a shorter term, higher intensity strategy than the longer term one. Uh, that's, uh, that concludes the information that I have on uh, de-intensification of shelters, isolation and quarantine, and then larger congregate uh, assessment centers and recovery centers. And I'll uh, stand by for questions from council members. Thank you, Mr. Floor. Do you, um, what can you tell us about the um, possible addition of even further IQ or ACRC sites? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we do have an additional uh, location that we are developing right now. It is, we have not yet assigned a purpose to it. That is a warehouse on Harbor Island uh, that we're currently outfitting for either use as a mass shelter, a shelter displacement or deintensification, or an isolation and quarantine. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are seeing there is the, it, it, we are still gauging the trajectory of the need on isolation and quarantine uh, to make sure that we don't have too many uh, locations or too few locations. Uh, there are not other isolation and quarantine facilities that we are exploring right now. Uh, I did mention that we are looking for one additional uh, larger congregate setting uh, somewhere in the south of the county for the ACRC uh, strategy, but have not yet uh, uh, identified a potential location. And then uh, I mentioned hotels uh, in the discussion of the first of these categories uh, for de-intensification. That is an area of focus right now where uh, we are looking to identify hotels uh, that might be able to play host to uh, all or a substantial portion of a shelter or uh, sheltered population so that we can provide them uh, with the ability to pre-quarantine uh, the facilities management division is seeking out locations right now, uh, and uh, as soon as we have uh, figured out which locations would uh, accept, if any, uh, the, the strategy, uh, I'll be able to provide additional information. Mr. Chair, thank you. Colleagues, if you could um, give me your last name. Up the Grove. Councilmember Up the Grove, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the sake of time, I have several questions. I'll throw them all, all together, if that's okay, Leo. Um, the first one is originally public health had communicated an estimate of a need potentially of up to 3,000 beds for isolation, quarantine, recovery. Has that estimate been scaled down based on the trajectory of the data? That's the first question. And then secondly, could you speak to how the public health order this last weekend impacts security at the sites? I understand there may be some additional security. And in that vein, have you been briefed on some sort of incident at the Kent Motel that's been reported at least one press outlet where, um, I guess, some people broke in and slept overnight? I don't know if you've been briefed on that. And so those are my three questions. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. As to estimate and trajectory, we have not uh, refined our estimate yet. You are correct that uh, in our initial calculations, uh, and this is based on percentages that were then vetted by the CDC, we saw that we could have countywide up to 1,700 um, 
people experiencing homelessness who would, over the period of the pandemic, potentially have severe medical effects from uh, exposure to COVID-19. That uh, is still the number that we are working with, uh, although we have not seen uh, numbers rise at that level yet. And so uh, we are not assuming that they, we are assuming that for right now that they, they will get that high at some point. Uh, and we are using the time that we have available to us just to, to, to create more uh, capacity and to rehearse the systems. One of the things that we really found, uh, you know, four weeks ago, uh, DCHS, uh, FMD, and public health did not own or operate any of these. Uh, and now four weeks later, uh, Sheila Capistani and the youth division are operating a motel in Kent. Uh, uh, our disabilities division is operating the Aurora site. Uh, our behavioral health and recovery division is operating the uh, Issaquah site. Uh, and we're finding that these are uh, very staff intensive uh, and they require significant behavioral health security uh, support. That is a segue to your second question, council member. So there was a uh, health officer order uh, that uh, he issued over the weekend that uh, essentially created a directive for folks who are uh, pending a test result and then an order for folks who know that they are positive and what that creates is the, the sort of legal structure under which the health officer uh, with court action could subsequently seek uh, to, to, to compel a person to remain in isolation wherever they are housed or unhoused. Uh, as part of that uh, we do have at all of our isolation and quarantine sites, both on-site security that is concerned with the operations within the site. Uh, and then we also have at all three operating isolation and quarantine sites an off-duty uh, Washington State Patrol member that's there 24-7. Uh, and their, their job is if somebody uh, leaves a facility against public health guidance or against the order, uh, that the, the Washington State Patrol can follow the person so that we can maintain contact attempt to bring them back to isolation through communication. Uh, but if that were not to work, it would also sets up the ability uh, to, to you know, notify the, the health officer and allow the health officer to make a determination of whether or not they should seek uh, additional action in order to ensure that the person isolates uh, until they are no longer uh, infectious. And so that's the additional security of which you mentioned. Uh, and then to your last question, council member, there is a, uh, there was a, a set of squatters uh, the, the Kent Motel is actually three separate buildings. The third building is one that we have not yet uh, retrofitted or, or renovated and are not currently uh, having guests in, and it's sort of back in the corner. Uh, and uh, we have uh, discovered that there were some squatters who were actually uh, jumping the back side of the fence and coming in uh, and staying there, and we're working with the facilities management division right now to ensure that uh, those, those units can no longer be uh, uh, broken into. Thanks. I have a question. Councilmember Colwell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Leo, is the warehouse on the Harbor Island the old Fisher plant? Uh, it, I've heard it referred to as the the flower warehouse. Okay. Member, I'm not sure if it's got another. I think uh, it's the one. Uh, but but it is that one. It, it also uh, had uh, has humble design uh, operating in it right now. Although we're working with them to consolidate their operations. Well, it's really an ideal facility in many ways because of its being so enormous. Uh, it absolutely it's big, and and the way that we're operationalizing that space for subsequent use is uh, actually inserting within it individual sort of mini shelters that are electrified, heated, and insulated within the warehouse. Uh, and so it will be suitable either for isolation, quarantine, or for shelter displacement, depending on what the need is. And the only thing I would uh, caution you on, and I know that Councilmember Dombowski and I had visited that years or so ago, is just the uh, connotation of people, placing people in warehouses, you know, for the people who are experiencing homelessness. But I think this is really a legitimate need. Thank you. Belducci has a question. Councilmember Belducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Leo, thank you so much for this update and for all the work your folks are doing uh, to be prepared. It would be a, a wonderful thing if we end up not needing all of this capacity, um, but it's good to have it. So my question is this. Can you explain one more time, because I'm still struggling to keep straight in my head, the differences between an isolation facility, a quarantine facility, uh, an assessment 
Center and a Recovery Center. Yes, Council Member. Uh, so the isolation uh, when a person is positive is how I've been remembering it, and then quarantine uh, for when a person uh, suspects that they might be either by exposure or by symptoms. Um, isolation and quarantine tend to go together, and so those are what we've been calling IQ sites, uh, and that is what we are operating uh, at, again, uh, we'll be operating at Top Hat or White Center and then are also operating in Issaquah, Kent, and Aurora. And these, the characteristics are that uh, it's individual settings, and so people in their own rooms. Uh, and then it's, uh, I think it's also distinguished by the time at, for which we believe that we'll be employing the, str the strategy. So again, uh, uh, we're planning on 18 months uh, back of the envelope right now. And then uh, I think the, the last part of it is just the uh, the number of rooms. And so uh, each of these facilities, uh, I think we had uh, previously briefed that even under the best circumstances, we think will be somewhere between two and 300. So it, the scale of the response is also a little bit different. Uh, the assessment center recovery centers was really a uh, response uh, to, you know, we looked at that 1,700 number that I mentioned uh, and potentially 3,000 if you counted people who are housed but could not go back to their house. Houses, And then we looked at that number of units that we had for isolation and quarantine, and we decided that we really needed to have the ability to absorb a much larger shock to the system, particularly if the epidemiological curve was a really uh, severe one. And so assessment centers and recovery centers are distinguished by the fact that they are shorter term, higher intensity, and then congregate settings for larger numbers of people. And so that's why we get like 140 beds or 240 beds per facility. And then the last thing that distinguishes them is as we've designed them, uh, these would be a place where a person would be able to get a test as opposed to being referred to it after having been tested. So for the, for the ACRCs, are these people who are experiencing symptoms or who are sick? This meeting is being recorded. Uh, it is uh, people who, so the, the other, I guess, way to talk about these as being different is uh, it is a strategy that would allow us to not go through the sort of intricate uh, referral process that we have right now, which is designed to be pretty precise in terms of who uh, we're serving. And this is, we need to serve more people more quickly. So um, anyone who is symptomatic, tested, or not yet tested could show up. And on the assessment side of these facilities, we would have the ability to, to administer testing and then pre-quarantine people or quarantine people as they awaited test results. And then for folks who we know are positive, they would uh, pass through to the other half of the facility that becomes a nursing level care facility for people who are COVID positive. And uh, the way that uh, public health describes this is cohort isolation. So it's isolation, but in a cohort setting as opposed to individual rooms. So for example, at Eastgate where you have two tents, will you operate one tent for the pre-quarantine and the other tent for whatever you're calling post-quarantine? Uh, we're, we're working through that exact uh, design feature right now, actually, Council Member. Uh, one is, I think you get, you can see the infection control benefit, and I am not a public health person, but uh, imitating one, you can see the infection control benefit of separate tents, uh, but there's also a scalability benefit of just one tent at a time that you could scale up to two tents and then scale back down to one tent. Okay, I'll, I'm going to just close by saying this. I, I think it's been hard for people to understand and certainly hard for me to explain how the large congregate settings will operate and not bring in people who turn out to not be infected without infecting them. That's the part I'm struggling with. And if we could get some follow-up on that, it'd be great. Thank you, Councilman Rywell. Thank you. Von Reifar. Councilmember Von Reifar, right please. Has a question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Leo, thank you for your presentation. I had a question relative to the South End projected site what are the preferred characteristics that you're currently looking for in the South End in terms of physical dimensions, uh, footprint, whatever? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, as we've seen it, the ideal site is one that we believe would be available for at least six months. Uh, 80,000 square feet is the minimum amount that uh, we're hoping for, electrified, uh, heated with running water, uh, and then uh, the ideal is an existing building into which we could operate, uh, but as uh, we've already seen. Hello? Leo? Mr. Leo, I lost you.
Perhaps he should go um, to the audio. Leo? Leo, if you can uh, hear no. us, we can't hear you. Yeah. Can't hear Leo. Can hear you guys, though. All right. We seem to have lost Mr. Floor for the moment. Um, Thank I'll you, have- Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I'd like to go back to that question when, if he gets back online, because I might have a suggestion, a suggestive site for him. Thank you. Great. We'll bookmark that. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to ask a question if we get Leo back. I'll put you on the list. Thank you, sir. Other, others um, to be on the list for when we get Leo back? Dombowski. Gotcha, Council Member Dombowski. And we're trying to reach Leo right now. Well, we know he could still be answering your question, Council Member um, Von Reichbauer. Okay, I think several of us are texting or reaching out to Mr. Floor. Um, until he reestablishes um, connection to the call, might I suggest we move on and invite um, Mr. Dively to begin his presentation? If that works, and if we can unmute Mr. Dively, I know that during the conversation he is needed to um, redial to reestablish his connection to the call. And I believe he is now unmuted. Mr. Dively? Yes, this is Dwight. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much. Great. I apologize that um, Skype is not working consistently for me. So phone, the old-fashioned phone seems to be the better technology at the moment. Um, So for the record, Dwight Dively, the Director of the Office of Performance Strategy and Budget. And I actually had eight things that I thought I would cover. And what I thought I would do is is do each of them individually and then pause for questions. And if Mr. Floor comes back online and you want to stop me after two or three or whatever and go back to Leo, that's fine with me. Uh, does that sound okay as an approach? Works well for me. Um, please proceed. Okay. So the first thing I thought I would share is some information about county operations that are affected by COVID-19 but are not the kind of responses that Mr. Floor is discussing with you. So uh, I had four of them that I thought I would mention. So first, I think all of you are well aware of uh, Metro Transit has seen a dramatic decrease in ridership, about 70% lower than normal as of late last week. And so they have reduced their level of service to something that approximately is what they call level C, and they are making preparations to restore service if it's too crowded in some areas or perhaps even to have further reductions if necessary. Uh, They have also uh, stopped collecting fares and have gone to rear door boarding for anyone who can, uh, obviously in the interest of providing greater social distancing for the uh, bus operators. Uh, Second agency I thought I would mention is parks. I think, as you all know, the parks facilities are closed. Uh, uh, Parks is continuing to do maintenance on facilities, so uh, the staff are still reporting. But uh, the facilities, you know, the the community center, the uh, restrooms and such are all closed. Uh, Third thing I thought I would mention um, are public health, environmental health um, restaurant inspectors have switched from their kind of usual operation to be doing inspections of the takeout operations that many of our restaurants have been forced to go to. And in the first round of inspections, which was not of everyone doing this, but I believe it was over 2,000 restaurants, uh, they found a compliance rate of about 97.5%. So the restaurants generally are doing a very good job of maintaining social distancing among their employees, of maintaining social distancing when people are doing pickup, 
um, all the kind of things that we expect. So, uh, so far, that seems to have been a response that has been very successful and is helping to keep at least some of our restaurants with a little bit of business. And then finally, uh, we issued late last week some direction about county capital projects. So projects such as wastewater projects, parks projects, metro projects. And essentially, if it is a critical response to COVID, like some of the uh, facilities that Mr. Floor is discussing, uh, we're implementing all the necessary social distancing and personal protective equipment, but we are proceeding with those projects, which is consistent with the governor's order about construction. For other projects that are not direct COVID response, uh, we are getting updated safety plans from the contractors, and if the contractors can demonstrate that they can continue with the project and meet all public health and CDC guidelines, uh, we will let them continue with the project. Uh, if they cannot continue with the project and meet all those guidelines, then we're going to shut those projects down. Uh, we also have our uh, project managers and inspectors who work for the relevant departments are uh, when they're out on job sites, making sure that the projects that are continuing uh, meet all of those requirements. So that's my quick update on other county operations, and happy to answer questions if you have them. Mr. Dively, this is Council Member McDermott. Um, I, I hope we can be um, very careful in inspecting construction sites such that if um, the contractor makes the decision to cease business um, versus the county where financial responsibilities lie and therefore motivation um, to take the most prudent course of action and um, one that protects um, construction workers and people in the building trades as well. Yes, that is exactly why we have taken the path that we have. Uh, we are also uh, having our county project managers and inspectors let workers know that if they feel like the uh, rules are not being followed, to contact that county staff person immediately so that we can check on that. Um, obviously, we want our construction projects to proceed, but only if all of the workers can be safe. Thank you. Other questions um, for Mr. Dively on his county operations affected by COVID-19? Dembowski. Councilmember Dembowski, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dively, for all your work. I wondered uh, if you might be able to give us a very high level look ahead about your um, prognosis and anticipation to the fiscal impacts to our county budget, uh, what you're seeing. Um, I know we're talking perhaps billions at the state level, but we've now had the passage of the federal, uh, you know, legislation, uh, the CARES Act. I know you were hopeful that we would see some relief there. And I just wonder, based on uh, what you're seeing there and uh, the uh, downturn in the economy and what you're seeing on its expected duration, you believe we'll be looking at here at the county. So, council member, that was uh, encompassed in items two, three, and four of this presentation. Can I hold it until then? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were done with your eight items. <laughs> no, no, no. That was just number one. You're not done Thank with you, me Mr. that quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Dive, any questions on item one? Hearing none, we do have Mr. Floor back on the line. And um, let's, let's go back and continue that conversation, if you'll permit us, Mr. Dively. Um, Mr. Floor, um, you are on the line and unmuted, it appears to me. And we're, we're in the process of um, responding to a question from Councilmember Von Reichbauer when we lost you. Do you need, um, if you can pick up or if you'd like Councilmember Von Reichbauer to restate the question, please invite him to do so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Leo Floor, and I, I can uh, complete my response, and I apologize. I should have paid for better Internet. The uh, uh, response to you, uh, Councilmember von Reichbauer, is we are seeking a site that is at least 80,000 square feet uh, that has the ability to have water, electricity, uh, and heat on site. 
Uh, we, per, we are finding that it is easier if it is an existing structure, uh, but that if it uh, is not an existing structure, we have, you know, on two occasions had the ability to purchase tents, uh, but that does have additional setup time. And then uh, relative proximity to a population or a concentration of folks that we believe will need uh, the services are the parameters that we're operating in. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Leo, for your presentation. And Mr. Floor, after um, we lost you, we did um, pencil in a um, couple more questions for you. Council Member Zahalai. Thank you so much, uh, Leo. Really appreciate the update. Last I heard, uh, somewhere between 10 to 20 people are currently isolating or quarantining at the existing facilities. Um, can you speak to what the most frequent avenues for getting to those facilities have been? Have they been hospital referrals? Have people been calling in on the hotlines and getting directed to their closest facility? Uh, what have been the most frequent avenues? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, the, the mechanism through which we are currently taking all of the referrals is through the, the COVID call center uh, that public health operates. And so uh, we have had hospital, emergency rooms, shelters, permanent supportive housing providers uh, make up the bulk of the referrals that make it through. Uh, just uh, to the extent that it's helpful, the major parts of this system is an institution and we'll call the call center. The call center will determine eligibility and then pass it to a separate team that we have called the isolation quarantine team. They will uh, consult a number of our databases uh, to assess the person being referred uh, and make a determination of what we're calling acuity, but to determine whether the person will be able to succeed with the supports that we have in place uh, at the facilities. And then for the folks who uh, we, we are able to say that we think that they'll be successful, then we place them at the facilities uh, and just, uh, you know, in, in uh, candor to your, our candid response to your question, Council Member, one of the things that we're working through actively right now is really trying to make sure that people know to call the call center so that we get uh, the right volume of calls and then making sure that we've got the right systems in place so that we're getting as many people as possible through the assessment into the isolation and quarantine. Uh, also mindful of the fact that there are some people who it will not be an appropriate intervention for. Thank you so much, Leo. And is there any data on how many people have been calling the call center, how many of them are waiting and for what uh, duration they're waiting on the line and whether they're hanging up because of dur uh, duration? I'm just hearing some anecdotal data that people are uh, waiting a long time on the call center line. Uh, we do have uh, those measurements, Council Member. What I will do is uh, get the latest version of them and then make sure that we provide them uh, to the council in an email update. Uh, we did initially have a problem with call times. The latest data that I have seen over the last two weeks have those call times uh, down, or wait times down significantly to less than a minute um, and really high pickup rates as the call center itself has become better staffed. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if there's anything we can do to help with that call center, providing any resources or anything, uh, I would love to hear about that as well. Thank you, Council Member. Next question is from Council Member Dombowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Leo, thank you for your work. Uh, with respect to the different types of facilities, kind of following up on Councilmember Bautucci's question, could you illustrate perhaps how they are staffed differently? What kinds of uh, expertise would be on each different site? What kind of uh, medical equipment, what the bed setup might be? In other words, would there be ventilators at some of these? Are they just... Uh, um, uh, beds with uh, curtains. Um, maybe that could help uh, help me understand a little bit better the difference. Thank you, Council Member. Um, the the headline on both the congregate and individual facilities or the I IQs and the ACRCs is, is that they are all sort of nurse level care and below. Uh, so we uh, are attempting to take from hospitals. Uh, the people who might normally be there but don't require that emergent level care. Uh, so we do not uh, believe that we will be operating ventilators, for example, at any of the facilities. Uh, and this is much more uh, people whose symptoms have not risen or have not yet risen to the level where they need emergent care 
or people who have had that level of care at a hospital but who are now ready to discharge but may not be ready to just go out on their own completely. Uh, the staffing model uh, at the isolation and quarantine centers, uh, we have uh, at least two nurses that we uh, keep on site. Uh, and then we have behavioral health uh, staff as well that we keep on site. And their, their role is really in sort of routine checkup and then to have the ability to uh, identify that somebody's case might be escalating. And if that's the case, uh, to get a medical consult with a public health physician that we have access to. And if we determine that the person needs a higher level of care, then we will uh, either arrange for direct transport uh, with one of the private ambulance companies, or we will uh, actually call 911 if it, if it is that severe. At the ACRCs, the level of care is going to be the same, although the staffing model is substantially different. We believe we'll have much higher numbers of nurses uh, and certified nurses assistants on site just because of the number of people who will be there. Uh, and then also just because uh, we anticipate that if we are fully utilizing these sites for the planned purpose right now, we will be in the middle of a really sort of intense uh, overall system usage. We are trying to uh, at least plan for what it would look like to be able to provide slightly higher level care as a holdover until we could get somebody into a hospital. Uh, but we do believe if we have these ACRCs fully uh, uh, populated, that it will be because the hospitals are absolutely full, in which case uh, we'll need a higher number of people per patient than we currently have at our isolation and quarantine facilities. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Floor? Lambert? Councilmember Lambert, please Thank proceed. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Floor, for um, going video so that it's easy to focus, and I so appreciate all your hard work. What I want to know is I'm concerned about the well-being of our employees and who we will be bringing in for second line and, and hopefully not, but third line, should that be needed, to backfill them. And I have had um, internationally trained doctors who are not certified here and who have, um, I've given them the information to call the state and we we're hooking that up. But how will we know from the state who these 150 doctors are that live in our county that are um, doctors in other countries but not here that could assist us as our backup? How closely are we connected to the state to get those names? Thank you, Council Member. Um, so the, the issue that you identify is one uh, that I am focused on very much right now. Uh, it is, uh, you know, to the extent that it's illustrative, it, it's division directors, assistant division directors, contract monitors. Uh, we have a wonderful team from Metro of uh, Metro employees who have come over to assist us, uh, and then public health nurses and FMD staff. Uh, and it is, you know, that is the crew that we are using to staff these facilities. They're doing that uh, seven days a week right now. Uh, and uh, the whole crew is pulling uh, somewhere around 12 hour days on average. Um, that is, as you point out, council member, not a wise uh, strategy in the long run uh, in a situation where we understand that the way that the disease works is it actually can reduce your people capacity. Uh, so we are, uh, in the isolation and quarantine facilities, we have limited uh, personal protective equipment, and we're uh, prioritizing that for the nurses, who are the ones who actually go in and have uh, contact with the guests at each of the facilities. Uh, and then we uh, are working to continuously improve the, the protocols that we have on site so that our own employees uh, you know, are able to stay safe while uh, volunteering to, to do the work. The second part of your question is where we are right now, council member, which is how do we build a longer term capacity uh, to staff these more sustainably uh, and to increase the level of skill. I, I don't have a specific information on the specific uh, uh, suggestion that you've highlighted, Council Member, around uh, contact with the state on non-certified uh, medical professionals, but uh, I would be happy to follow up with you and understand that resource because we are, uh, I'd had a chance to brief earlier to the Council and it still remains the critical constraint for all of this is staffing. So please do contact me. Um, I talked to the president of that, corp of that group yesterday, and they are 150 doctors willing to help. So 
I did do the proper thing in telling it to the state, but I also want us to know that they are in our county. And so please give me a call. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Floor? Hearing none, um, I will thank you, Leo. And we will um, turn back to Dwight to continue with the next seven items. Okay, thank you. So the second item that I was going to cover was a little update on the costs we have incurred to date and some projections of costs out into the future. So uh, what we're doing is starting this Friday, we are generating a compilation of how much we have spent so far. Um, that is uh, imperfect at this point. Uh, we still are working with departments on their cost tracking, but it will get better over time. So we will have the first report this Friday. Um, I can tell you that for the facilities that Mr. Floor was describing, uh, we will have spent over $23 million just to acquire and implement those facilities. That does not include operating costs. Uh, some of that money is not yet out the door, but uh, that's the estimate of what we're going to spend. And then if you ended up needing all of those facilities and you operated them for two months, the cost forecast is about $12 million for the group of facilities. So these are going to be both very expensive to develop and expensive to operate. And, of course, that doesn't include any of the other costs we have for all the work that public health is doing, uh, the work that DCHS is doing in homeless shelters, et cetera. So just to give you a, you know, just a little order of magnitude of estimate of what we're going to end up spending for this, uh, that should give you some indication. Um, I am happy to find a way, uh, after I've reviewed the uh, weekly reports, if council would like to see those, uh, we can certainly work out a mechanism where we'll transmit those over to the council, uh, not in a formal way, but in an informal way, um, early the following week. So I think we can address that offline for those who are interested. Um, any questions about costs at this point? Mr. Chairman, I would, I would just identify that I think you'll find an interest in the council and um, the information from that report you'll get on Friday when you're, we have it together to share with us next week, Mr. Dively. With that, council member done. Lambert. Thank you. Uh, Dwight, thanks for your leadership on this issue. Um, before your report uh, is made available to us here in a few days, are, how are we doing in terms of the rainy day reserve cash flow sequence? Uh, as it lines up with uh, income coming in through our tax basis. Do we have the reserves necessary to fund these uh, ongoing at this point? Yes, Council Member Dunn, I'm, I am not very worried about cash flow. Um, we have the reserves that you're noting. Uh, we also have already received some of the state money that was appropriated, so that is very helpful. And the information we've received from the federal government is that at least some components of the federal money will be available far faster than is typically the case, um, literally within a month. And so I think that cash flow is not going to be a problem. Okay. So second and last follow-up question, Mr. Chair, thanks. So, you know, if you look at some of the steps we're taking in terms of flattening the curve, compared to other cities, we've been pretty darn successful so far, uh, but of course we're just in the first or second quarter of this, of this challenge. Um, the question I have is, are we being reimbursed for a substantial part of these by the federal government? In other words, is there value in deploying additional and broader strategies? Do we get more bang for our buck because we employ those strategies early, put them down and get reimbursed, or is that a cost that we will bear locally? Do you follow me? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Council Member. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, federal money in just a minute. That's item three on the list. But uh, just so Council Members are aware, the federal legislation that was passed last week covers costs starting on March 27th. 
So the costs we incurred prior to that will not be covered by that federal money. They will be potentially eligible for FEMA and other reimbursement, and they will be eligible for the $200 million that the state appropriated. So one of the challenges we're going to have is sort of matching costs with uh, state and federal revenue sources. And so my office and the Office of Emergency Management are working very carefully to track these costs and then figure out which kind of bucket we can go to to try to recover them. Um, so if we had the capacity moving forward to do even more, it looks like that would be eligible for this new federal money. But as Mr. Floor noted, we are basically just running out of capacity. We're running out of staff. Uh, we're running out of contractors, and so money may not be the constraint on doing even more. It may simply be the staffing and the contracting ability um, and the supply availability and things like that that you, money just won't buy you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I am very interested in your numbers, uh, Mr. Dively, as always. And I would like to propose that there's probably quite a few of us. And so I would like to propose that we have a special meeting on Friday or Monday or whenever it's convenient early to your getting those numbers so that we can all hear them together and be able to discuss what we think from those numbers and the implication of those numbers because they are, um, they are huge. Councilmember Lambert, we have the we have a committee of the whole scheduled for a week from today at one in the afternoon. Mr. Chair, I'm aware of that, um, but I believe that you have a robust agenda, so I didn't want to presume that you had more time on that. So I, our, okay. our work is our our work is focused on COVID-19 in the committee of the whole now, so. The, um, this may be very much what we need to be um, reflecting and thinking about come Tuesday. And that'll be early next week. All right. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Mr. Dively, the line is yours. Okay. So let's move on to number three, and that's the federal funds. So um, as all of you can imagine, a the federal COVID-13 bill or uh, COVID-3 bill, I'm sorry, um, is close to a thousand pages long and was hurriedly written. So we are working with the prosecutor's office and outside legal counsel to try to understand um, what all is there that we can potentially access. So let me talk about two specific things, one of which is pretty clear and one of which is not very clear. So the clear one is there is a large appropriation for public transit agencies with a pretty clear formula about how that gets split up. And so it looks like we will get about $245 million for Metro. The, those provisions are also pretty clear that you can use it to cover incremental costs, uh, you can use it to cover lost revenue. You can use it to cover the costs of recovery. So Metro is working on um, a plan of how they would use that money. Obviously, we don't know a lot of information about how much our lost revenue is going to be, for example. But uh, we will end up with, I think, a pretty clear proposal for Metro. The second part of the federal money is the $150 billion that was allocated <coughs> excuse me, to state and local governments. And it's pretty clear that about $3 billion of that will come to Washington State. And then it appears that that money will be split between the state and the five governments that have more than 500,000 people. So King, Pierce, Snohomish, and Spokane counties, and the city of Seattle. How that allocation is made is not very clear in the bill. So 
So the lawyers are still trying to figure that out. But there will be a certain amount of money, a significant amount of money, that comes to King County directly. And then presumably we will also be eligible for a share of the money that the state gets. And the state will get uh, the lion's share of the money. So that's a much more complicated thing. It is less clear how you can use it. Um, it is very clear you can use it to cover incremental costs. And so a bunch of these costs we're talking about will be eligible for that federal reimbursement. Uh, but whether we can use that to cover lost revenues is much, much less clear. So we're still working on that one. And frankly, that's probably the most important one and the most flexible one that we are hoping to get. And then there are also a variety of other allocations to specific categories uh, where uh, King County likely will be eligible to get some of the money either by formula or by application um, and work on those as further uh, away. We have prioritized Metro and the large part of general money first. Uh, so I know that's a little vague on everything other than Metro, but that's what we know at this point. And, you know, as the days go by, we will figure out more, we'll get more guidance, and uh, we can update you next week on that. So any questions about the federal money? I'm hearing no questions on the federal money. Okay. So now let me go on to um, the question that Councilmember Dembowski asked a little earlier uh, about the economic and revenue impacts. And let me just start by saying we have absolutely no data. Um, we, this is all being done by impression. It is being done by modeling that national uh, forecasting firms are doing. So what I'm going to tell you now is just my best guesses, and I apologize that I guarantee you they are wrong. Um, the, just to give you a data point, we will not see our March sales tax revenue until late May, and that will be the first time we actually have data about what has happened with our sales tax revenue. Um, so let me start by just noting that there are major winners and major losers right now uh, with the impact of COVID on our economy. So I'm going to just quote you four companies and what the value of their stock has done since December 31st of 2019. So basically the last three months. Netflix is up 10%. Amazon is up 3%. Boeing is down 50%. And Nordstrom is down 61%. So as you all know, there are sectors of the economy that now are in greater demand, and there are sectors of the economy that are basically closed. So that that's not like a normal recession where basically every industry sector is adversely affected. Um, I'm going to just give you some guesses of what I think we could see in sales tax losses just this year, 2020, uh, compared to what we expected in the March revenue forecast. And I think these are reasonable guesses, but it all depends on how long this lasts, how fast we recover, whether it comes back next year, et cetera. So for the general fund, we could lose $26 million, which is exactly or almost exactly the size of our rainy day fund. For Metro, they could lose $127 million, which is roughly half of the amount of federal money they're going to receive. The Mental Illness and Drug Dependency Fund, which is our flexible money for behavioral health programs, could lose $14 million. So if we don't get um, state and especially federal money to backfill revenue losses, um, it is going to lead to very dramatic impacts 
on our funds that are affected by sales taxes. And th there's all kinds of other funds that, um, you know, potentially are affected as well because of declining economic activity. Um, so that we just to give you an indication of what we might be looking at, depending on how this federal money plays out. Um, so I'm going to stop at that point and see if you have questions. And if we want to talk about other revenue sources, we can. Uh, that was kind of just the estimates I put together for our call today. Zahalai. Questions for Mr. Dudley. Council Member Zahalai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dwight, thank you so much for that presentation. I have a question that's going to sound really, really dumb. But from what I'm hearing, are you saying that Metro is going to be better off after all of this because they're getting twice as much as they're losing? Is that an accurate reading? I'm, I'm just trying to understand those numbers. Um, I, I would say that is uh, – I understand why you might think that, but that is not an accurate reading. So let me go back. So in addition to the revenue loss for 2020 uh, from sales tax, Metro is losing – in essence, all of their fair revenue. Uh, they have also faced uh, incremental costs of extra cleaning and things like that that they have done. And it's inevitable that they will face further revenue losses, at least in 2021, uh, as sales tax you know, recovers slowly coming out of a recession, as perhaps fewer people are riding buses, so I don't think we can declare that Metro is likely to end up being a winner. It is, I think, reasonable that Metro might come out about even. Thank you, sir. Further questions for Mr. Dively? Council Member Dimbowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a clarifying question for Dwight on the revenue impact numbers he just provided. Uh, what period of time is that for? That was just for um, 2020. And I, uh, this is a remarkable coincidence. Uh, Dave Reich, our chief economist, just emailed in the last half hour um, his kind of guesses like my guesses of what these revenue losses could be. And... Um, Maybe I should go back and get my economics degree. I guessed $26 million for the general fund, and he's guessing $29. Um, and all of our other sales tax impacts are very, very similar. Now, what he did, which I didn't do, is he then said, okay, the current uh, predominant economic thinking is that we'll have a very sharp recession literally right now. And then a recovery that's reasonably rapid, but probably will extend at least into 2021 and 2022. So let me, uh, I'm just going to use the general fund because they're all proportional. He has about a $29 million loss for 2020. And then he has another $16 million for 2021 and $11 million for 2022. So the... Uh, 2122 loss is roughly the same size as the 2020 loss. And so that would mean that cumulatively we're looking at something for the general fund that's uh, on the order of $50 million less sales tax revenue than we had expected for that three-year period. Now, again, I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm sure if Mr. Reich were on the phone, he would say these are all extremely preliminary. They're, they're just estimates, um, but they're – the kind of numbers that we're talking about uh, if we don't end up with the ability to use federal money to backfill at least some of our revenue losses. Uh, thank you, Dwight. Okay. And uh, uh, time for one more, Mr. Chair. Please. Uh, thank you. You covered the, the sales tax focused uh, impacts on general fund, Metro Transit, which is nine tenths of a penny and and mid, which is a tenth of a penny, but we also have uh, significant impacts to our lodging tax funded programs and our real estate excise tax programs, I imagine. Any early reads on those? Yeah, so uh, real estate excise tax, since we receive it only in the unincorporated area, uh, will take some kind of reduction, but um, 
most people think that the residential housing market will actually do reasonably well through this. Um, I have to say, here in my neighborhood, now that I'm walking around three times a day to get out of my office, um, it remains remarkable how many houses are selling. Um, so I'm not sure that REIT is going to be a big concern. Um, you are absolutely right with the lodging tax, and I think that's the one that's going to be the, the hardest to figure out. I'm just glancing at what um, Mr. Reich sent here, and I haven't read his rationale for how he calculated this. Uh, he's looking at, instead of $35 million this year, 25 and next year, 2021, which is the first year that revenue actually comes to King County, instead of about $39 million, only about 33. Um, so that's about a 15% loss in 2021, and he has about a 10% loss in 2022. And I would say, and again, he's the economist and I am not, I would say that may, in fact, be an optimistic projection. Um, right now, the hotels and motels in King County are close to being vacant. Um, even if we get through COVID fairly quickly, uh, a lot of the conventions and the tours and the uh, cruises that would have brought uh, people to King County uh, later in this year, those have all been canceled or many of them have been canceled. So recovery of the hotel industry very quickly doesn't seem likely to me. And then if we have a recession, all of that kind of activity is adversely affected. So it could easily take two or three or four years for the lodging tax to get back to where we had expected. Lambert. Council Member Lambert. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that. <laughs> Such positive news to think about. It's giving me a headache. But thank you for your great um, forecasting. And um, also, Mr. Reich, both of you are amazing. Um, what I, my question is on the bus purchases. So as we are looking at our bus purchases, can we put any of those on hold or stop, being that there may not be a quick recovery back to the buses for a variety of reasons, and um, so we may not need as many buses. Councilman Lambert, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I will follow up with Metro. Um, we have been in a very intensive purchasing uh, pattern for buses that I think was going to slow anyway, but let me see what uh, I can get for you. Thank you. And a program I was watching the other night on TV was talking about the idea of after COVID, we may want to change the configuration of buses and such um, internally. So I think waiting and seeing what we learn and then what adaptions we may need to make. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Further questions? Mr. Dagley, if you'd proceed. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Zahalai, please. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dwight, I've spoken to you offline about this, but many small businesses in our county are struggling a lot, understandably, given all of the closures and the other economic effects of this virus. Could you speak a little bit to what you know about the federal level or state level money that's coming in that we could help coordinate and to supporting our small businesses, um, just a little bit on small business support and any other kind of direct support you can think of for our for our constituents. Yeah, so um, the small business support, there are portions of the new federal bill that are, I, as I understand it, significant increases in community development block grant funds. And those are, uh, if they're normal, CDBG funds, they are very flexible, and they are the kind of funds that the city of Seattle is using for some small business assistance. So that, I think, is the most promising um, place to go to uh, do small business assistance for uh, businesses outside of our major cities. So one of the things we are looking at is 
what restrictions, if any, are there on those funds. And then, as you know, there are also a lot of other programs in that bill for business, um, some obviously only for very large businesses that can, you know, do sophisticated applications. But it's my understanding there are also programs targeted to small business. So uh, we need to get uh, more information for you about that. That's on the to-do list. Uh, but the first thing I really think we need to do is look at this CDBG money and see if we can use it for that purpose. Just to clarify, Dwight, is that, can that money only be used by the cities, or could King County utilize that money as well? Because there's a big gap for unincorporated King County where people are saying, well, the cities have the capacity, they have Office of Economic Development, they have um, these block grants, but King County doesn't, and, you know, what the cities can do stops at their city limits. Right. So if if in this bill... CDBG funds come to the county, then we can use them in the unincorporated area exactly as you are describing. Um, as you and I have discussed, we don't really have an infrastructure to do that. And so one of the analysts in PSB is looking at, you know, could we quickly create such an infrastructure, or if not, could we contract through the city of Seattle to administer a program on our behalf? So we're looking at both at, um, are we going to get some money? And if we did, and it, if it was the council's guidance to use some of that money at least for small business assistance, how would we get that out the door uh, rapidly so that we can save some of these businesses? Thank you, Dwight. Up the Grove. Yes, member up the Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dwight. Uh, along those same lines, uh, one of the things that has impressed me has been the way that uh, a number of nonprofit organizations, including some of the smaller chambers of commerce in the suburbs, um, have stepped up and are providing guidance, support, webinars, training, um, community engagement um, with small businesses. And I'm wondering if there's a way, um, as you think about uh, ideas and work with the council on any proposals relating to economic assistance to small businesses to help use them as a delivery tool, even if it's for information. And my interest is twofold. One, I think they're doing a good job of having good communication in the community. But secondly, um, they as nonprofits, uh, these smaller ones are struggling themselves. For example, the Kent Chamber of Commerce has laid off all their staff except there's their executive directors, the only employee, yet the work that they're, the services they're providing to these small businesses um, is more critical than ever. So it's part a plug and um, uh, a suggestion that as we develop any responses for small businesses, that we look at ways to use uh, particularly the smaller chambers as part of our tool for either communication or delivery. Thanks. So, Councilmember, that's a great idea. I had that had not occurred to me at all. So I, I made a note of that. Um, so r let me uh, see what we can do about that. I would just. It, it is very unfortunate that in the entire King County government, with fifteen thousand employees, we have exactly one person whose job it is to do economic development, um, and that's the consequence of twenty years of budget cuts. Uh, as opposed to, like, the city of Seattle that literally has dozens of people that do that. Uh, the other place where we would normally look to get resources to work with our small business community in the unincorporated area is the Department of Local Services. Uh, and as those of you know that since that department was formed, they've actually done a great job in that area. But we have, in essence, borrowed virtually all of their staff, the director's office staff, uh, because they are that good, to support COVID response. So just finding a person or two who knows something about this within the government is going to be a challenge. But I really like that idea of grants to the chambers to help us do information. Lambert. Council Member Lambert. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, Dwight, were you talking about Hugo, or were you talking about um, the lady in the executive branch? Um, so Hugo is the person, as you know, in the Department of Local Services. 
Um, there is a uh, Paige Shevlin was the person in the. Uh, it's actually technically in my office who was doing economic development. Um, her position is vacant because she left to move back to Washington D.C. So at this point, we literally don't have anybody outside of DLS. So I have a person that you might want to know about. So if you want to call me, I have somebody that might be able to step right in and help you. Um, sure. Um, given my calendar, could you send me an email, Council Member, with sure. that information? And then we can maybe go back and forth that way. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And I'm going to invite Dwight to move on. Um, and I'll note that it's almost 2.30. And we've committed to have Mr. Dively um, out in time to join a 3 o'clock meeting. Great. Thank you. So I think the last four will go faster. Um, because the, the three of the four are really just for information. So the fifth thing I wanted to cover was to give you a sense of some future impacts on county operations that uh, you should start thinking about. So just to re repeat something I said earlier, a lot of this depends on how uh, the federal government allows us to use some of this money and whether we can use it to offset revenue losses. But having said that, let me give you two examples where we're already starting to see impacts that a recession would make uh, even worse and even longer. So the first one is solid waste tonnage is trending down fairly rapidly, um, both self-haul and commercial haulers. Uh, and as you know, the solid waste system is something close to a fixed cost system. So if tonnage goes down, rates have to go up unless we make some significant changes such as reducing the operations at on certain hours at certain transfer stations or closing a transfer station. Uh, so we're, that change in tonnage is troubling, uh, but not terribly surprising given what's going on. Uh, the second area I thought I would mention is in permitting in DLS. So um, as I think everyone knows, when you have a recession, the amount of construction activity goes down. And we saw that quite severely in the Great Recession. Uh, permitting has minimal reserves and not a huge ability, uh, even with your approval, to raise permit fees. So that could have some fairly significant impacts uh, starting next year in permitting. And you could think around other parts of the government um, where you can see how a recession affects demand and affects our services. So we're starting to think about those things. Uh, certainly those things will all come up in the context of the 21-22 budget. Uh, but the impacts are broader than what we typically see of just thinking about public health and human services. We're going to see impacts across almost all of our government. And that's about all I was going to say on that point. Lambert. Colleagues, Lambert. Council Member Lambert. Thank you. So um, as of two days ago, I had constituents tell me that they call permitting and were told that they have a backlog of four to six months. So even in this, I'm hoping that we can be in the near future closing that backlog off so that we will be able to be more timely in processing like other cities can. So whatever we do, I think we need to come out with a time plan where they are not four to six months behind. Council Member, I have not heard that, and that would surprise me greatly if it were true. So let me follow up with Mr. Taylor, and we'll get back to you. Thank you. I, I did complain to him about that yesterday in, in our conversation, so it won't surprise him. Thank you. Okay. Other colleagues? Mr. Dively. Okay. So the sixth item on my list is the county's liability insurance. Uh, which coincidentally uh, is being renewed today. Uh, it's a policy that starts April 1st of each year. Uh, through very good work by our risk management staff, they were able to place some of our insurance coverage several weeks ago. But even in doing that, it looks as of this moment that we will be able to buy only about $75 million of liability insurance as opposed to the $120 million of coverage that we have as of today. 
Um, the insurance markets are uh, in total turmoil, given uh, all the things that have happened with earthquakes and fires and hurricanes and very high jury verdicts. Um, now COVID has them completely spooked. So we're going to pay more in premium for significantly less coverage. Um, and even if we were willing to pay more, the coverage just literally is not available. So this is kind of a secondary impact of COVID, but it's one that um, you should be aware of uh, that will potentially affect us if we ever had a very high judgment. Okay, it sounds like I can move on to number seven. Actually, um, Paul Wells. I have a Council question. Member Cole Wells. Thank you. I have a question. Is this something, Dwight, that Congress could address? Um, that's probably a question for Jennifer Hills. I, nothing comes to my mind about what they could do um, other than maybe some kind of liquidity facilities for insurance companies, but that might be something you should follow up with Ms. Hills. Thank you. Dembowski. Councilmember Dembowski. Thank you. On the insurance uh, point, Dwight, uh, is our policy for liability a occurrence-based or claims made? Um, it is – I wanted to make sure I answer your question right. I, you know, I should get back to you. I, I know that, and I'm, I know I'm going to tell you the wrong thing. So let me have Jennifer Hills follow up with you. Thank you. Mr. Dively. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the seventh thing is the, uh, just again by coincidence, um, we are coming up on a bond sale in a few weeks. Um, the municipal market has been quite strange. Some days great, some days basically you can't sell anything. Uh, but we are doing the bond rating agency calls this week and next with the three rating agencies. And so it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, of course, we've prepared information about COVID. Uh, but it is going to be very interesting to see how they are treating state and local governments in these circumstances. So probably in about two weeks, maybe three weeks, uh, we will have bond ratings, which will give us a sense of how uh, that part of the market is viewing King County in comparison to other creditors. Um, so more on that to come. Colleagues? Mr. Chair, Ms. Very quickly, Reagan Dunn here. Council Member Dunn. Thank you, sir. Dwight, any reason to believe we're going to lose our AAA bond rating? Um... I'm not the rating analyst, so I can't really answer that question. I doubt we would, um, but what is very possible is each of the rating agencies has a uh, what they call a watch where they are saying, well, we're really concerned about this, and rather than lowering the rating at this point, we're going to put some kind of watch on it. Um, so sometimes they call that the negative outlook. So it would not surprise me that we would keep our ratings, but we would receive a negative outlook given the uncertainty about our revenues uh, coming out of this uh, situation. That's Thank not a you. prediction, yeah, it's just an indicator. Yeah, just an indicator. I believe that happened back in about 08 or 09 in King County. So it's it not did. You're, you're absolutely Thank remembering correctly. Can, uh, Mr. Dively, please proceed. Okay, last point for me. I just wanted to note that you are uh, either have received or likely will receive three pieces of finance-related legislation this week. One is the uh, child care proposal based on funds from the Puget Sound Taxpayer Accountability Account, or PASTA. Um, the second is a proposal for lodging tax that we would use to support tourism and potentially some arts uh, organizations. Uh, the executive has not made final decisions on that, so I can't really give you any details, but we are trying to get that to you this week. 
And third, uh, the Harborview bond measure is ready to transmit. Uh, it's the same proposal as you are familiar with, but it will come over to you this week as well. Great, thank you. And Holly, that's all I had, unless there are other questions. That's all, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dembowski. Holly, Councilmember Dembowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Dwight, thank you for the super helpful update. Uh, in the last Great Recession that involved the stock market crash, there were some uh, impairments to some of our investments in the investment pool, um, and some steps were taken after that uh, to, uh, I guess, change the investment guidelines. Is there anything percolating over there of an adverse nature, given the stock market drop that, and the and the other markets' uh, volatility that we should know about? That's a great question. So um, two weeks ago, I asked our Treasury uh, unit to give me an update every Monday morning on the status of the county's cash pool. So what the balances are, uh, what we've purchased, what we've sold, uh, what has been called in uh, by the issuers of the debt, and whether we have any impaired investment. So um, they and I are on top of that. At this point, there are no problems. Um, I will say that the reason that the county had some impaired investments, uh, what now, 12 years ago, was that the county relied on the rating agencies to tell us whether or not uh, some securities, uh, particularly uh, commercial paper, were safe investments. And the county purchased some commercial paper that was rated AAA, that turned out to be basically junk in some ways. And that's why those impaired investments happened. As some of you know, we have recovered virtually all of those losses, but it has taken 12 years to do so. Um, the county's policies that were adopted after the recession preclude those kinds of investments. And so we are not relying on rating agencies to just tell us that, oh, yeah, this is AAA, even though, frankly, we never even looked at it. So the, there, is, there certainly is a chance that this would happen again. Um, we do own some commercial paper um, in companies whose names you would recognize and are strong companies. Uh, so there always is that risk, but it seems like it's a very low risk, and we'll know about it right away. Also, as those uh, commercial paper investments mature, we are not at this time reinvesting in commercial paper uh, because we want to really see where the investment market goes before we go back into that. So um, I'm happy to keep you updated if you're interested. Thank you. Balducci. Further questions? Council Member Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, and I add my thanks, uh, Dwight, for your, you uh, convey an awful lot of information very uh, succinctly. It's easy to follow. It's very grim, but it's easy to understand, so thank you for that. Um, as you're talking about number your number eight item and possible uh, revenue measures that we're looking at or use of revenues, uh, I would like to add to the list a thought for some of the hotel motel tax that has already been bonded for capital projects in the affordable housing uh, area. I understand that there was a significant remainder after we did our last funding round, uh, and I would love to have a conversation, uh, whether in this meeting or, or, or next week's meeting or some other way, to about whether that money could or should be repurposed for emergency costs like um, providing shelters for people coming off the streets or this sort of thing. I mean, it could be something that could be reimbursed, but it seems like um, there are resources there to help some of the maybe nonprofit agencies that are providing housing, maybe rental vouchers for people who are having a hard time maintaining their housing. It seems like there's a lot of need out there that uh, our, our funds uh, for for those kinds of services are going to be stretched. 
uh, but we have this pot of money that might be repurposed similar to how we re are going to be talking about repurposing some of our Puget Sound Taxpayer Accountability Act funds for child care. So I wanted to put that out there and see what you think about that. Yeah, that, that's a great thought. So two things um, on that, one of which I should have mentioned already. So the thing I should have mentioned already is while we are sending over the pasta and the lodging tax proposals using those revenue sources, it looks to us at first glance that we could also be using the federal money for those sources. So we're going to be including um, language in those that notes that we may shift the funding source to federal funds at some point. So just bookmark that, that um, we may not actually end up using those monies necessarily. Okay. Um, in direct response to your question, um, there is still a lot of flexibility in the housing bucket because we of the lodging tax because we've not actually issued any debt at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's lots of flexibility there. However, you may recall that the uses of that money are constrained by state statute. And so the flexibility to do some of the things you mentioned, Council Member, probably isn't there under the existing language. And so that might be the kind of thing we should look at, see if we would like more flexibility, and then approach the legislature about, given this crisis, are you willing to loosen up some of that language so we can use money in a different way? Right. So just to follow on that, um, Mr. Chair, uh, the, speaking to the governor's office last week and to a couple of elected officials yesterday from the legislature, uh, I heard two things. One, that we're not the only jurisdiction potentially looking for strings to be removed from various revenue sources that we may have that could be repurposed for, and, and cities around the state have that could be used for um, emergency purposes that can't be used based on the sorts of things you're talking about, Dwight. And the second thing is I heard yesterday, at least informally from one of our state senators, that a uh, special session is very likely. And so I think we should be I think we should be teeing this discussion up right now. I'll tell you, I'm hearing just a ton of pain from nonprofits all over the county because they're getting the double whammy that they get whenever there's an emergency or a recession, which is more people need help and they have less money to help and losing their entire spring fundraising cycle for many of them. It makes even the, the bigger, more stable organizations uh, very challenged in their budget, and the smaller ones are just absolutely hurting. So I really want to ask that we have that discussion. And then I, I'm thinking as we're talking about places where the county's role in responding to the crisis is, um, I heard, you know, uh, lodging tax proposal, and I understand that there's a proposal coming over to support tourism and culture. I wonder, and I may be off topic here, Mr. Chair, so just sort of gavel me. <laughs> uh, I wonder who's helping people who are undocumented in this crisis. I wonder if any of the supports that are coming from the federal or state government are helping those folks there because they're here, but they're not going to be eligible for, you know, income, you know, to file income tax returns and get checks, I'm assuming. Um, I think we really ought to be taking a look together with your office, Dwight, and our central staff at where are the needs that aren't getting met by other levels of government? What's our lane as a county? What can we do to fill those gaps? And, you know, where are the resources that we can try to repurpose and be ready to make an ask for more flexibility with our revenue, if that makes sense? And then the final thing I'll say here is that um, I I'm reading today that Apparently, in order to qualify for stimulus checks, you need to file a tax return. So there's a lot of people who don't. You know, I think particularly about young people who maybe don't make enough money or seniors who don't file anymore or um, for whatever reason. And it seems like an outreach program to make sure people are filing their tax returns, doing whatever they need to do to be eligible for the stimulus checks might be something within our zone. So I just put all that out there. I don't know that we need to discuss it now, but I wanted to get it out for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Further comments, discussion, colleagues? I call Wells. Council Member Colwell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Dwight. I, I have 
some of us had spoken with Aaron uh, Robart, Robart uh, recently, and with regard to the lodging tax revenue, I, as I understand, we had about $187 million available for TOD projects to start up the pre-design, design, and so forth, and that $150 million of that has been allocated with $37 million available. Is there anything going on to be able to get that money distributed at this time? So, Council Member, in the normal course of events, DCHS would be, you know, putting that money out uh, in various rounds of funding opportunities, uh, and so that they would be actively working on that. Um, as you can imagine, right now, as Mr. Floor talked about about like an hour ago, um, almost his entire department is now focused on COVID response. Uh, even if they have no expertise in that area. So I think it's probably fair to say that that remaining funding um, is on hold at the moment until the housing folks in DCHS can get back to their real jobs as opposed to their emergency jobs. Um, but, yeah, they, they are trying to get that money out as soon as they can were it not for what's going on right now. And. Following up on that, with regard to what Councilmember Balducci was talking about, the, there's so much desperate need out there. Could we do anything? Would this have to be done at the state level through the legislative action to be able to use some of those funds for rental housing, uh, vouchers, uh, et cetera? Yes, that would require state legislation. And I also would remind all of us that we don't get any of this money until March of 2021. Uh, the money today from the lodging tax is going to the public stadium authority. And so we're a year away from when King County will actually get any of this money ourselves. So we're bonding against it. This is Claudia, right, Dwight? That's how we are putting out the COD. Yes. yes. Council Member Valducci. Thank you have you, a question? Mr. No, I, uh, I just jumped in and interrupted. But you're, in terms you were correct. Okay. What we have done is, in some cases, bonded against that revenue that will come in 2021. Council Member Colwell, further question? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Colleagues? Mr. Chair. Mr. Dively. I'm sorry, Balducci. Yes, please. Uh, please I just, before we, before we uh, leave this item, it's, it seems like we're wrapping up. Uh, we've been talking offline for quite a while of trying to have a sort of organized effort where we assign our staff and we work with PSB to do kind of a needs assessment, sort of similar to what I was describing earlier. I mean, I have my list of things that I think we should be doing. Others have uh, found other important things we should be doing. But I feel that the effort to just take a, an objective and somewhat comprehensive but very quick look at where are the holes out there in the community that we need to be filling now? How do we position ourselves for the recovery in terms of what, we, what revenues we have that we should be using now and also how we start to, to rebuild later? this kind of short to medium term stuff as opposed to the longer term next biennium stuff. Um, I would love to get an informal electronic nod of heads that we can assign the staff to go and start working on that so that we can have some proposals or at least ideas before us for our next meeting. Good idea. I'm not in. <laughs> Thank you. I'm nodding as well. Sounds good to me. Sounds great to me. Dave, sounds great.
I'm waiting for the sign language person to finish before I answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. I hear some um, broad support for um, coordinated coordinated work. Thank you, Councilmember Belducci. And I also want to um, very much thank Mr. Dively, and I don't know if Vidi's still on the line, Mr. Floor, for their presentations today um, and spending time with the council. Um, this is an important conversation that we need to be able to um, stay current and have with the executive branch leaders. We appreciate your time and um, conversation today and the work that you're, you and the executive branch are leading every day. Um, a, a sincere thank you um, to you, Mr. Dively, and Mr. Floor, whether he's with us still on the line or not. Thank you very much. Happy to do it. Thank you. And with that, um, we will move to public comment. comment. I would ask, I'm not certain that there is anybody on the line um, for public comment. If anyone is on the line and wishes to um, offer public comment, I'd ask you to speak up now and let, let us know so that I can outline how we'll run public comment. And I would ask the staff to unmute the attendees in the call so they have the opportunity so they can be heard if they were saying that if anyone is saying they do want to Mr. offer public Chair, testimony. Mr. Chair, there is currently no one on the line. All right. And I'm going to dispense with my pages of notes about how we're going to run public <laughs> comment. And that brings us to item six, a briefing on the state and federal COVID-19 response. Um, this is our last item. It's a briefing from council staff on what we know about the state and federal responses to COVID-19. Um, for an orderly discussion, again, I'll ask members to please hold your questions until the end of the briefing. And with us today is Max Nicholson, the council's director of government relations. Mr. Nicholson, the line is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, council members, this is Mac. Uh, I'm going to assume that you can all hear me, um, but I'll take a quick pause. Yes, we can. Thank you, Mac. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mac Nicholson, Director of Government Relations. Uh, I was asked to provide an overview of state and federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic. My plan for today's briefing is to go over the three pieces of federal legislation, one of which uh, Mr. Dively uh, spent a little bit of time talking about and then move into uh, the state response. Uh, there are some materials for this briefing for those who uh, have their computer in front of them. I think they start on page nine of the materials. I expect there will be uh, some follow-up um, and we'll happily uh, do that as much as possible. Uh, Congress did pass some significant complicated pieces of legislation in a very short amount of time. Um, and uh, Jenny GM Batista and Simon and I and, and some other folks from the policy shop uh, have spent some time going through it and trying to pull together all the uh, kind of materials uh, that you see in front of you and that we'll go over today. Um, starting with the most recent uh, federal response bill, that's the, the CARES Act or the COVID-3 bill. Uh, this was signed by the president on Friday. Uh, it's a $2.2 trillion package, uh, checking in at 880 pages. As we've gone through it and tried to organize it, uh, we kind of look at three general buckets of money in the bill, so resources that are available for individuals, resources for businesses, and then resources for governments. Um, so starting with the individuals, the big pieces in that particular piece of legislation um, is the extension of uh, unemployment assistance. Uh, the bill expands and extends UI programs to the non-traditional workers. So these are the folks who are self-employed, the independent contractors, the gig workers, um, they are all included um, uh, and eligible for unemployment insurance. The bill extends the duration of benefits available uh, under unemployment insurance programs and then increases the weekly benefit by $600 uh, for up to four months. There are also in the bill direct payments to households. This is something that uh, Councilmember Balducci just briefly mentioned, the one-time checks of $1,200 to individuals. They're structured as tax refunds, so the uh, the stimulus checks are going to go to individuals who have filed tax returns. Um, for those that haven't filed tax returns, uh, it seems that, that they will be asking for some simplified tax refund or tax paperwork uh, to be submitted so that uh, contact information, bank account information can be learned. 
these checks are $1,200, an additional $500 per child. Uh, the rebates scale down as income increases, so those who make under 75000 will get the full amount, and above 99000 will be entirely phased out. That's for individual tax uh, filers, uh, different provisions for couples and heads of households. For individuals, the bill also includes some mortgage relief. Uh, it requires companies that service federally backed mortgages to grant forbearances of up to 360 days to borrowers who say they have been harmed by the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, it also prohibits servicers from initiating foreclosure and processing foreclosure-related evictions for 60 days starting March 18. Um, the bill finally also provides some student loan relief. All loan and interest payments would be deferred through September 30th without penalty to the borrower for all federally owned student loans. Moving to kind of the big pieces for businesses, um, for small businesses, there's a $350 billion Paycheck Protection Program that was established. This will be administered by the Small Business Administration. The money will be made, uh, or the loans will be made in the form of 10-year loans that can be forgiven under certain circumstances. It is expected that businesses can start applying Friday. Uh, so if you uh, have communication with businesses, uh, I would encourage uh, you to encourage them to do that ASAP uh, because $350 billion is a big number, but I think it will go pretty quickly. Small businesses and nonprofits with up to 500 employees are eligible, as are self-employed, sole proprietors, freelance, and gig economies workers. They can all apply for loans. Um, the loans are given up to a maximum of $10 million or two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs. The bill also includes uh, $10 billion for economic injury disaster loans. These are types of uh, business loans that are generally available in the event of disasters. Um, since this is a disaster, they are available this time. For the larger businesses, uh, there's about $532 billion in loans and assistance programs. These are more broadly available emergency relief loans for these larger, medium, and, and large businesses. Uh, the Treasury Secretary and the Federal Reserve are expected to issue further guidance uh, over the coming days and weeks to kind of clarify how all of that uh, money and, and loans and assistance will be uh, doled out. There are provisions in the bill that limit some executive bonuses and stock buybacks. Uh, within that $532 billion bucket, uh, there are some specific industries that uh, are granted some specific uh, pots of money. There's $60 billion in loans and grants for passenger airlines, uh, $8 billion for air cargo carriers, $17 billion for what is uh, uh, understood to be Boeing, though Boeing is not specifically named in the legislation, um, and then a billion dollars for Amtrak. And these are all uh, within that large bucket for uh, business assistance. Moving to the general bucket for governments, um, this is the hardest part to pin down. Uh, as Mr. Dively mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of money going into sort of existing channels and into existing programs and trying to get a sense of how much of that comes into the state and how much of that comes into the county. Um, is something we're tracking down, more information becomes available uh, every day. The biggest exception to this is that $150 billion coronavirus relief fund which is uh, available to state and local governments. The money is going to be allocated on a pro rata basis. Um, so the expectation is Washington is going to get close to $3 billion. Um, and then local governments above 500,000 can get direct allocations of that money. There are some restrictions on that expenditures. Uh, they need to uh, be necessary expenditures that are incurred due to the public health emergency response, COVID-19. Um, they must not be accounted for in the state or locality's most recently approved budget. Uh, and third, the expenses must be incurred uh, by December 30th of 2020. In addition to that $150 billion uh, piece, there's about $274 billion going to state and local governments for specific purposes. Uh, local governments can expect to receive some of this federal funding from a variety of programs to assist in local government response. A uh, number of programs funded through the CARES Act will provide a portion of supplemental funding to governments that is generally based on current formulas and available for expenditure through fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21. Uh, by means of example, the, the $25 billion for transit that Mr. Dively mentioned, um, this will be uh, uh, sent out by the Federal Transit Administration uh, through their 
existing funding formula distribution um, with King County Metro expected somewhere around 240 million. Uh, there's 850 million for the Burn Justice Assistance Grant Program. Uh, this helps counties address needs of police and jails, including overtime and PPE. Uh, this funding will be rolled into current funding levels and awarded to local governments through the typical grant application process. Uh, just kind of looking at existing formulas, expecting somewhere around 16 or 17 million for the state of Washington. Uh, one of the other uh, pots of money Mr. Dively mentioned was the community development block grants. There's about five billion um, less clarity on how that money is going to flow out, but we will try to track that down. Um, some other items, uh, just to flag, there's about a hundred billion in this bill for hospitals to help cover uh, expenses and lost revenue, 16 billion for the strategic national stockpile, 15 billion for food stamp program, and 9 billion for other nutritional programs. There's $45 billion in new disaster relief funds for FEMA. Um, there's $150 million for the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities for various grants. There's $400 million for election assistance. This is to expand early voting, vote by mail, and for poll workers. Again, sort of back of envelope math, expecting Washington to get somewhere around $10 million out of that uh, election assistance money. So moving on to the, the COVID-2 bill, uh, this was signed March 18th. Um, this had a couple of pieces. One was a, the paid sick leave program that provided two weeks of qualified sick leave wages for employees who have to self-quarantine or seek treatment due to coronavirus. This bill also provided about a billion dollars for food and nutritional funding, um, split up among senior nutrition programs, WIC, emergency food assistance. The bill included uh, uh, $1.2 billion for COVID-19 testing, uh, and then $1 billion for states to start ramping up their UI, their unemployment insurance systems, uh, in expectation of the, the massive influx of, of applicants. And then the COVID-1 bill, which signed uh, on March 6, this was an $8.3 billion emergency supplemental bill, uh, provided about $2.2 billion to the CDC to support prevention, preparedness, and response efforts. $560 million was set aside for state and local grants. Washington's going to get somewhere around 14 for that. I think our Washington already has received about $14 million for that. Um, there was about $3 billion for research and development for vaccines, treatment diagnostics, uh, a billion for drugs, medical, medical supplies, training, um, and then there was about $500 million for telehealth services contained in that COVID-1 bill. Moving to the state response, um, some of the most kind of significant ones I'm sure you're all familiar with have been through the governor's uh, emergency proclamations. Um, I will just kind of highlight a couple of the stay home, stay healthy order, um, a recent one, uh, uh, waiving and suspending time for local governments to prepare and file annual reports with the state auditor's office. Uh, the governor issued one, easing requirements for uh, the initial and renewal health care provider licensure certification. Um, this is something I think uh, Council Member Lambert briefly mentioned earlier uh, in the hearing. And then the governor uh, issued one waiving in-person open public meeting requirements. As far as the legislative action, uh, legislative wrapped up early March, and one of the last things they did was pass a uh, $200 million uh, coronavirus response bill. Uh, it was House Bill 2965, prime sponsored by Representative Cody. Um, the bill had about 100, or the bill had 175 million appropriated from the state rainy day fund for the state, local, and tribal government responses to coronavirus. These funds are appropriated through the, the governor's budget office, the Office of Financial Management. There are some restrictions on money. Um, can't be used to supplant existing uh, funding sources. Um, of that 175 million, so far about 75 million has been distributed. I think I, I list the, the four or five distributions there on the materials in front of you. There's some for UW Medicine, for the Department of Health, for the Healthcare Authority, um, to the Department of Commerce, uh, and then to the Department of Social and Health Services. That bill also included uh, $25 million in essentially benefit charge relief for employers. So under traditional UI system, uh, benefits paid get charged back to the employers um, who then pay higher uh, unemployment insurance rates. $25 million was used to sort of wash that out so that employers um, will not be paying uh, for benefits paid to employees who were laid off as a direct or indirect consequence of the COVID-19 outbreak. As far as other state funding pieces, Commerce uh, earlier this month uh, released about $30 million in emergency housing grants to help local governments create housing. 
necessary for quarantine isolation and additional sanitation. King County, uh, I think, got about 10.7 million. I think DCHS is the lead uh, working on that. Um, Commerce recently uh, awarded 1.8 in uh, grants to rural counties uh, to assist people and businesses impacted by COVID-19. There are some other state agency responses in front of you, uh, like Employment Security, Department of Labor and Industries, who have all taken action to try to make their uh, systems more accessible to individuals uh, seeking assistance. And that's uh, everything quickly in a nutshell. Uh, happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Colleagues? Council Member Cole Walls, in just a moment. Mac, can you tell us again the amount of the COVID-1 bill? COVID-1 was, was $8.3 billion. $8.3 billion. Thank you. Council Member Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, relating to the federal student loan payments, suspension for six mm -hmm. months. I'm hearing from some people that it's the, on the surface this sounds very helpful, but when you really read down into the fine print, it is not. I'm wondering if you've heard anything. What I've heard that it's a forbearance, meaning that the interest will capitalize for borrowers who go this route. And if someone is one month delinquent, they will automatically be enrolled and thus have their interest capitalized. Have you, again, have you heard anything on that? I have not, but I am happy to look into that and see what Thanks. I can find and provide you some information. Thank you. Dembowski. Councilmember Dembowski. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Mac. Thanks for that report. Um, I probably should have asked this to Dwight, but uh, he had a time limitation. In one of the bills, maybe it was the first one, the Congress, I think it was the first one, enacted um, an additional two months, I believe, or perhaps it was 80 hours of uh, federally supported sick leave. Uh, one of the things we're seeing here in our government, where we employ about 15,000 people, is an evolving response to our employees leave and our policy related to it, as well as uh, continued pay. And I think that evolution has kind of come as the uh, response has changed and the severity of the measures needed and the prognosis for the time. And so I'm not being critical of that changing response, but I do think it's important that we get it right. Um, Mac, what, if you can tell us, do the federal uh, pieces of legislation do for our employees with respect to their leave? Council member, I'll look into that and get back to you because um, I want to be sure <laughs> of the answer so that I'm not um, kind of getting out ahead of my skis on this and giving you the wrong information. Um, but I will sp specifically look into that and see what I can come up with as far as how those federal uh, relief bills impact King County uh, employees. Fair enough. And, and that may be a complicated question. Feel free to ask for some help from our HR folks or labor sure. relations folks. And for my colleagues, I, I would like to make sure we keep this on our, our radar. I know we've heard from some of our uh, represented employees and their representatives from firefighters to truck drivers to public safety workers. And I really think we should not require, given the unique nature of this public health crisis, folks to be using personally accrued benefits uh, when they've got to comply with not coming to work or if they're sick because of a, an exceptional pandemic. And I hope that's some direction that we can take up and, and uh, give to the executive branch if needed. Here, here. Mr. Chair, Thank you. Council Member Belbici. I agree, and I actually think it's the uh, current policy that if people are staying home because they've been directed to, because they are exposed, presumed sick, at risk, in other words, available to work but being told not to work, I think that our current policy covers that with what we are now calling COVID-19 leave, which is a form of administrative leave. I would be more reluctant to say that somebody who gets sick shouldn't 
be able to use their sick leave, they should. They should use their sick leave. That's what it's for if you're sick. There's a pretty robust uh, donated leave policy that's been set up for people who exhaust their sick leave. And if there's a particular work unit or uh, section that is very hard hit, I could see asking to take a look at what other types of supports could be provided to them. But I think a blanket statement that anyone who gets sick shouldn't have to use their sick leave would be, it would be a major change in policy. It, it, uh, it suggests that using sick leave is a bad thing. We give paid sick leave. We give lots of paid sick leave. We are a very generous employer in terms of the amount of leave that people are given, both sick, vacation, and other kinds of leave. And that's what it's for. It's for if you get sick. But if people are running out of leave, then we should support them, and we are. So I, I, I think I'm hearing something that sounds quite broad. Maybe that's not what's intended, but I, I, I would be real cautious before suggesting people should be exempt from using their sick leave for when they're sick. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember Dombowski. If I could just respond with a little bit of a different Please. perspective than Councilmember Balducci's. I understand that line of thinking. I would suggest, though, that perhaps this particular uh, situation, the COVID-19 situation, is, is, is unique and uh, was not contemplated in the development of sick leave policies where presumably you set forth an amount to take care of a normal expectation of being sick in the ordinary course of things, not come, not really predicting a virus that's new, that's novel, that's extremely contagious, uh, and that's devastating if you get it, um, and that the recovery period is, it can be pretty significant, and that the mandates for recovery are to not come to work at all. So it's a, I think it's a maybe a little bit different than our basic kind of illness program when you get sick and might warrant a, a little different treatment, but something to talk about. Mr. Chair? Councilmember Balducci? Thank you. I, I completely agree it's different, and that's why there's different treatment being provided. That's why there's administrative leave being offered that was not offered previously in similar circumstances. That's why we have this combined donated leave program. I mean, we have stood up as a county, and when I say we, this is the executive branch has stood up, and we're following along with these same um, proposals for our employees in the legislative branch. But I think what I heard was that people who get sick with COVID-19 shouldn't use their sick leave period, that it should, they should be able to reserve all of it and get, and I, I don't agree with that. I think that there, we might need to have support for people who have to use up their sick leave in ways that they didn't anticipate, that we didn't anticipate in setting the levels. But to say totally exempt from using sick leave, I think, is to forget what paid sick leave is about. Paid sick leave is for when you get sick. You have it to use. And so I just, I think we are stating uh, different points of view on whether or not sick leave should be used for people who are sick with COVID-19 who work for us, but not at all saying anything different in terms of policy of keeping people in paid status. Absolutely, we should do that, and that's that's our goal, and I support that completely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we, we definitely are sharing different perspectives on that. That's, I think, why the federal government gave an exceptional first-ever 80 hours of, of sick leave to address an unprecedented thing. And, and I, I just really think we should think about whether this new illness with exceptional uh, contagious levels and severity of, of impact when you get it, something that we should fo require folks to use a personally accrued benefit or to go ask others to donate when that's for, you know, a common cold or other, or other, other things like that. So they're just different. And, Maybe not. Maybe 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 we shouldn't grant an additional benefit, uh, but it, I think it, it warrants some discussion. Cole Wells. Colleagues. Councilmember Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mac, thank you for your presentation. I have a question regarding the requirement that individuals who receive their $1,200 or whatever amount stimulus checks uh, are, have to file or have filed their tax returns. I had understood that individuals uh, who 
receive a social security disability or other types of entitlements may not have to fulfill that requirement? Do you know? Unsure. I'll look into that uh, as well. I think a lot of these rules are kind of being um, figured out as we're going along. Sure. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. Other questions for Mr. Nicholson? Mac, this is uh, Mr. Chair. This is Pete von Reichbauer. Council Member von Reichbauer. Mac, uh, at our next meeting, I hope you can follow up on um, any information relative to a special session that you might hear from your sources as well. Certainly. Will do. All right. I want to um, thank you, Mr. Nicholson, for um, the presentation on the state and federal response. And we'll look forward to hearing more from you next week at the Committee of the Whole meeting. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's participated in this in the um, briefings today and the important conversations that have ensued. Members, I want to remind you to stay on the phone for the special council meeting, which um, begins momentarily following the adjournment of the Committee of the Whole, and with no other business to come before the Committee of the Whole, this committee is adjourned. Please stay on the line. <laughs>